All right. Let's get back. and just preach or tell people who he is. He first and foremost fundamentally determined that we be the material evidence. Is that understood? We be evidence. And that we need to build the theology. We have to build the Christology in terms of our understanding of this. That I am a representation of God wherever He's placed me. <coughs> so, in being that representation, the representation of God, I, understand, I need to understand it by going back to the mind of God. And that's what we need the Spirit. If you went to John, Twenty-seven, And when the parakletos, the helper, which also the word parakletos means advocate, when the advocate, okay, if you go into your Bibles, you will find that word there, and see it now in the, in the, in the, in the legal context. See how in a court of law, the advocate is going to come, and he is going to use you as evidence to convince the world that God intended for all men to be his sons. Can you see it? Is, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. And the 11th day principle, the principle We are talking about I am presentation cannot another. And in the first we read six. Just put it on the board, please. And when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will what? He will testify, which is the same word, he will witness. Okay, or he will bring material evidence of what it means to be a son of God. When we talk about testify of Jesus, if you have a Pentecostal, or what we call a pneumatic lens, a lens of the pneuma, 
You will only want to talk about his miracles, how he healed the sick, how he raised the dead, how he walked on water, how he fed the multitude, how he took a coin out of the fish's mouth, and all the other stuff he did. But when you have a heavenly view, you will understand that the ministry of Jesus at the age of 30 only commenced when the Father, when the voice from heaven said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, my pleasure is in this model. This is what I waited 30 years for. I waited for the child to become a son. For unto us a child is born, but a son is given. So when the son is born, that's when the ministry of sonship started, and the son then said, the kingdom has come. Are you hearing me? So if we don't get the order right, you'll be arguing about what came first, the egg or the hen. Okay? It was only after God put his son in creation, God took a break from active work. He ceased from working. And he, the only thing he did after that was to set aside another day, which he called Sabbath. In other words, he could rest knowing that in the son will he find a, not only a representative, but a deputy. A deputy. One who will deputize on behalf of him and act as if that son has now got the power of attorney to do all things. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes, the first thing the Holy Spirit comes to do to us is to teach us about sonship by using the template, which is called Jesus the Christ. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he's not coming to teach you how to walk on water. He's teaching you how to study Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, who is the fullness of the unseen God, and in him all of God rested. And if you saw him, you saw the Father. Now the Holy Spirit takes out of Jesus all that you need to know, and he starts to teach us that. The first evidence of the Holy Spirit being with you is not just simply the speaking in tongues, which we all should covet. The Bible, why would the Bible say, covet the Holy Spirit, or covet tongues, if, it is, if, if according to Pentecostals, it should be the first evidence that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit? Why then do you need to covet it if you've, it was already given to you automatically? Come and think with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And yes, Paul says it's very good for all of you to covet this because this is a language that will get you to speak to God. All right? And when you speak in prophecy, you're speaking the will of God to people. So for me, the first evidence of the Holy Spirit coming amongst us is to first give you an evidence from inside you, and that evidence is that your spirit will cry out, Abba, Father. And you know, that doesn't happen the first day your baby is born. Does it happen the day that you're born, that the baby is born? No. The first thing the baby does is it screams. Okay? But many, many weeks or months later, there'll be certain phonic forms coming out like pa, papa, poppy, dad, da, ma, mama. But it takes recognition, development, identification, smell, whatever, for the baby to say mama, dada. And that's what the Holy Spirit will teach you. He puts in you the spirit of adoption, where you, your spirit cries out. And sometimes, because we have not understood the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we get so caught up with all the other activity, the mundane activity, which is very important in its right context, that people don't recognize the voice that cries out within it, Abba, Father. And that spirit, it may not be a verbal articulation, but that spirit in you will tell you, God is your father. You are his child. That's basic. That you are intrinsically, legally, and genuinely, credibly, 
connected so that you are now connected to the original intent that you are not born of flesh, but you're born from above of spirit. Now that, when that's in you, that's become part of your witness. Your witness is that you're a son of God. For as many as received him, to them gave you the power to be called sons of God. Power, dunamis, to be called the sons of God. The sons of God. First thing that happens. The second thing that happens that you now, as a representation of God, learning how to train your ear to obey, to listen. That's why one of the prayers I pray every day is give me the skill of a listening ear. Like food to my palate. May your words be to my ear, I pray. Like how I can taste spice in what some people will say, hot food. The same way I want to hear the voice of God. And so I train my ear. And sometimes you can eat a hundred meals and not appreciate it. But immediately your palate awakens when you taste food that has culture, refinement, it's got spirit, it's got heart, and all sorts of things put into it. Um, and then you realize, wow, this is an odd, extraordinary meal prepared. It's not anything that you just eat to get full. Okay. Similarly with the word, you listen to a thousand sermons, and then bang, something grips your heart. And you know that you train your ear to ear. And what you're doing when you're hearing you're operating, you're, you're, you're learning how to be obedient, to function in that. So that's the key. There's another word I want to introduce to you. It's found in Genesis chapter 2. So what does the Holy Spirit come to do? To teach you about Jesus. So, I mean, about sonship. So, and, and, and what's very key here, because we have used this for worship. We say that the Holy Spirit will not come to talk about himself, so we must not worship the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Bible is saying. What the Bible is saying is the Holy Spirit is not going to teach you about himself because if he teaches you about himself, you will become invisible. <laughs> but he wants to ta- teach you about Jesus, how God in the flesh can function as a son. He wants to make visible sonship on a proliferate level where all men will function in this dimension. And that's how judgment comes to the world, to convict people of sin, which is to miss the mark or the original point or the original design that God had that the whole human race will function as his sons. Have you got that? And bring you back to the point of your departure. And and you know in John, there's one very difficult portion of scripture in John that says that if he is in you, you cannot sin. You know what that means? It doesn't mean you cannot have moral blemishes and ethical failures. What he's saying is if you are plugged into sonship, then you have, you've come to your place of rest. You can never depart again. That means you cannot sin. And there are other ethical failures and coming short of God in down sittings and, you know, and all of that. There's other definitions of sin. I'm not in any way attacking or suggesting that you can now go and live how you want to as long as you claim to be a son of God. What I'm saying is that when you come to that dimension, you know I've reached it now. I'm no more wanderer. I'm no more searching. I'm not no, no more looking. I'm plugged in. And then when you're plugged in, you start to live like a son. You clean yourself. You dress like a son. You change the way you think. You behave like a son. You talk like a son. That's what the Holy Spirit comes to teach you. I'm asking him to do that because, I mean, I've got so many weaknesses in me. So many, and I have to work on it. Lord, help me. That the, 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 the seven spirits will be on me. Help me. I mean, what's the first in Ephesians, in, in, uh, in uh, Isaiah 11? Just put it on the board. Put it from verse 1 onwards on the board. I want to show you this because this is what the Spirit first comes to do to you. And then we look at uh, Deuteronomy, Exodus chapter 20. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Okay, this is the, the lineage. This is the lineage of the church. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. <clears throat> and the spirit of the Lord shall rest 
upon him. Now, the word, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him is a very key. The, the, the words are the spirit of Yah shall rest upon him. Now, I want to talk about that. Because to be a witness, you have to understand when the spirit comes upon you, what he puts on you. He puts a name on you. It's called Yah in the Old Testament. And Yah, out of Yah comes the family of names like Yahweh, Jehovah, or Yah. It's Y-H-W-H. And that's the word that some people will not use. It's the, it's the, the most exalted, unpronounceable, the most powerful name of all the names that God has been attributed or described by, the name Yah. What does the Holy Spirit come to do? The first thing when he comes upon you to make you an exact representative, he comes upon you and he puts on you the spirit of Yah. In other words, he renames you or surnames you or genes you to function as, as the son of God. That's the first thing the Holy Spirit does. And this is critical to take note of. You know, I've, I've written some notes here. On the name. Let me quickly find it. Name. When the spirit of Yah comes on, it's, it's called the self existent name, the eternal name, the eternal name, the absolute name of God. And some people are so sensitive of, about that name. So, with the first thing the Holy Spirit comes upon you and he says to you, let me tell you who your new daddy is. Let me introduce you to your father. Let me write it into your, your mind. Look at John, look at Revelation chapter 14. Just put that on the board, please. 14 verses 1. Revelation chapter 14. And then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000. That's an apostolic community. A global apostolic community. It's a multiple of 12. Having his father's name written on them. What does that mean? That's your new paradigm. It's not a mark. It's not like 666. It's a mentality. It's, a, it's a, an intrinsic perspective of who you are. That's what it is. So if you say you're part of an apostolic community... Not only do you stand with the Lamb, which speaks about representation, substitution. And, and, and if you understand the principle of a Lamb, a Lamb lives to die for another. A Lamb does not live for itself. It's a, it's a, it's a defenseless animal. The Lamb lives only to represent, to stand on behalf of another. If a Lamb sheds its blood and that blood is sprinkled on the altar... The whole sin of a nation is forgiven. And so when God speaks about a people who comes into the world, um, out of the loins uh, uh, of Christ, we do not live for ourselves. We only live for another. And on, on behalf of the other, we cover the sins of the whole world. How do we cover it? By having a mentality on our forehead that has been written by the Spirit that we do not serve a God called Yah. We serve a God called Father. Yah migrates to Father now. The most intimate, personal relationship you can have with God. And remember what the word witness means. And it means to bear in your mind, to be written on your mind. When the Holy Spirit comes, what does he do? He writes into your, your heart of flesh. Into your mind, the law of God. The first law is that you are not a son of this world. You're a son of God. And now that you're a son of God, you function as God's son in the earth. Are you hearing me? Say to your neighbor, you're a son of God. That's the first evidence. Romans chapter 8 tells us the spirit crying out within us. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. And you need to make sure that that's written into your spirit. Go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You know, Jesus prayed a prayer 
And he said, Father, I've kept your name. If you read about the design of the t temple of Solomon uh, that was given to David and then ratified with, with Solomon, this is what God said of the temple, that this temple will keep my name. Am I correct? Keep my name. And when the temple did not keep the name by bringing in other idols, or corrupting its eternal purpose, then God destroyed the temple. Why did he destroy the temple? Because if it does not keep his name, then there's no reason why it should function. Are you hearing me? And what's the temple now? It's us. And what should we do? Is preserve his name. And how do we preserve his name? What does the word name mean? It literally means, literally means uh, reputation, fame, glory, memorial, identity, authority, character, honor. I'm going to say it slowly. The word means reputation, fame, glory, memorial. Identity, authority, character, honor. The word comes from a word, the word sem for name comes from a word which means to set in place, to establish, to install. So what's the first thing the Holy Spirit does when he comes? He comes to set in place in your thinking what, who you are. You're not just a Christian belonging to a religion that will compete with other religions. You have now been brought into a place where it's established in your mind that you're a son of God, placed on the high, in the highest family of all the families in the earth, and your father is the creator of all things. Have you got that? Please, we can talk sonship until we go blow, blue in the face. I've come to the conclusion, and I've said this, I think about four years ago, or in the last four years, I've said, you can have a spiritual father, but if you do not know God as your father, you're an orphan. Because your spiritual father can fail you, and if you still behave like an orphan, that means that God has never come to, uh, into your life as uh, the, the father. And while we all should encourage the idea of development and mentoring by connecting, but the ultimate is, you have to get this installed in you. That's why Exodus 20 uh, verse 7, the, the third commandment is so important here. And it says, you shall not take the name of the Lord, Yah, your God, Elohim, which means supreme one, in vain. In vain. In other words, you, listen to me now, should not misrepresent your father, who is the supreme one, you should not render him worthless or invalid by the way you function in creation. That's what it means. So, so uh, uh, and it says, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In other words, God will not just treat you as if, you know, uh, you just did something foolishly, but God will make you accountable for misrepresenting his name. So when we talk about witness, you can't talk about witness like, oh, I need to score points, to earn rewards, to, sit, to get a place in heaven, and if I worked enough, maybe I'll get a good seat in heaven with a good view of Jesus, and if I worked extraordinary well, I would get a few jewels in my crown. That's how religion sold itself to us. But what is God saying now in the third commandment? which describes him, the first four commandments is about him, is basically saying to us, representation, preservation of his name, his reputation, his glory, his presence, his identity, and everything he is, is critical. And who does that? It's us. It's us. Okay? So say to your name, a neighbor to witness for Christ. You have to be a good son of God. Your testimony, your testimony is sonship. Is sonship. And your sonship, your sonship comes out of the template yeah. called Christ. Christ. Is that understood? So you can't go and act like the devil and his angels 
in your workplaces, do your own stuff, live a life of duplicity and double standards, and then come to church and put on your Christian look. That's what witnessing is. It brings us to the next point, which is the high priesthood of all believers. And you know that we have migrated from the, from the Levitical order to the Melchizedek order, which assembles and models for us how we should function. But if I may borrow the example from the Levites, the Levites were not given land possession. So they had no land, no province, no state where they could live. But what God gave them was 48 cities amongst the, 12 tri the 11 tribes or 12 tribes. One tribe had two. Okay, 48, four times 12. Four cities in each tribe. And there in those, in those cities, wherever they lived, in those 48 cities, the Levites had to become the conscience, the presence, the representation, and the protectors of the Holy Father that they represented. How they lived brought conviction and judgment to everybody else, and their example became the example by which others would imitate and emulate. They will function uh, they functioned as the conscience of society. Similarly with all of us, if we are going to move into the high priestly function of all believers, God takes one city called the city of Jerusalem. He replicates it all over the earth, wherever you are. He takes the only model. God doesn't give us a country. Abraham looked for a country, but God gave him a city whose builder and maker was God. And that city now, wherever we are, it comes down there. And wherever that city is, there's a priestly order that creates the tabernacle of God in the midst of all humankind. So when we talk about witness, we are not just talking about witness. We are talking, about in, in, in all actuality, if we get this right, nobody has to go into the whole world. Because there are enough believers in every part of the earth including the Muslim countries that are anti-Christian right now, including the atheistic countries. Every part of the world, even countries that are, are, are so secure like North, North Korea, where, the, where there's a, 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 an aggressive move against the believers. But if we create the systemic presence of witness, let me tell you something. Judgment has already come to the world. And judgment to bring it back to God. But, but this is not the case. The, the collateral damage done in the church today is through the way people have presented the gospel because they have not become the gospel. And we've said things. We've said things like, in this season, the message and the messenger must become one. The prophet and the prophecy must become one. The declaration and the declarer must become one. People must learn how to be a representation of Christ, not some religious freak. Jesus could hang out with people. I mean, I, could, I, I look at the template. Why would you, being the holy God, sit where drunkards sit? Why would you hang out with unclean women like prostitutes? The one that poured the perfume on you, bought that perfume with prostitution money. Why would you go to a man that defrauds? I mean, you know the story in this country about state capture. And fraud, and then you go to stay. In, you go to his house, to Gupta's house. <laughs> you go there. That's Matthew, the tax collector, one of the biggest frauds. Oh, Zacchaeus, a man that knew how bad he was. Why would you do that? Because how else are you going to witness? And what do you go and do there? You don't go to, eat, you don't go to preach. I want to come and eat with you. I want to sleep in your house today. I want to hang out with you. And when he leaves the house, he's, he's taking some money with him also. <laughs> There's a distribution taking place to the poor. We got it all wrong. We got freaks. We've got eccentrics, we've got religiously sick people, we've got people that don't know how to be normal because that's how God built the body, to be normal. 
And then we're talking about how we're going to be witnesses. Okay. The other word is the word deputy. All these words belong to an apostolic family of words. Representative, shalem, deputy. Go to, go to Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host. Everyone say host. host. The word is sabah. Sabah. Of them were finished. Kala. And, uh, and the Lord, uh, and on the seventh day the Lord ended his work. Everyone say work. work. The word for work is the word melak. It's, it's not the same word. It's malak. It's, it's not the same word as Melak, Melek, which is king. Melak, yeah. So look at those words. And on the seventh day, go, go to the previous verse. Thus the Lord, the, the heavens and the earth and all the host, Sabah. And part of the host in that context could include us. And Sabah means to create everything to function with military precision, discipline, and in submission to a certain order which demands servitude. Servitude. Look at ecosystem today. Every order of creation is serving another order. But ultimately, everything, including angels in the eternal, have been geared and wired to serve the man. Everything in heaven and earth was geared to serve us. And what is our purpose? To witness to them or to become a university to them. So that all of creation, on whatever echelon they function, would know God through his presence in a people. And what are, are, is our purpose then when we have received all this, I mean all of these things serving us, we witness to him by serving him and saying, you deserve the glory you deserve the honor. Our ultimate purpose is not to serve ourselves, but to serve him by the things he gives us. Are you, are you, are you hearing me? That's key. So the word sabah, but the word, the word for melech here is what I, I find to be best. And when God finished these works, next verse, ended his work is the word melak, melaka which literally means, this word, out of this word comes the name Malachi. Malachi. It means to be sent. To be sent. And to be sent to function as God's deputies. So when we say witness, you can't talk about witness without understanding deputization. Understanding that I am on assignment that I cannot do anything without him. One of the best ways for me to understand deputization is in this word maturion, which means martyr, or matur, which means martyr. And the word martyr means to die, literally die. You can die two ways. You can die on the stake, you can die by being killed or persecuted for your beliefs. But there's a spiritual way that I want to suggest, and this is it. If I want to deputize for the one who sent me, let me do what I should do. Give up my life. Lay down my life and tell him to come and fill me. That I will not live for myself anymore, but I will only live for him. And if I give up my life that's called a corpse, I'll be no different, maybe looking beautiful, but lying flat on the ground, motionless, lifeless, until he puts his breath in me. That's where the spirit comes in. And when the spirit puts his breath in me, I now say that I do not live for myself. I only live for him. And whatever I do, I will do it for him. Whatever I say, I will only say it if he tells me. Whatever I do, I will do it only by what I see him doing. That's how representation takes place. So, in a sense, you have to add this word to witness. It's called deputization. And the word is malak, malek. Out of that word also later on grows the word king, king. That's how I become a king. 
but I function as a deputy. I empty myself. I'm not anymore interested in my personal opinions. I'd rather walk away from a fight. I'd rather give up a position, but I'm not going to do anything unless he tells me to. Are you hearing me? Now that kind of a thing has to come back if we're going to bring witness. If I could fast track now, fast forward to the, to the new covenant. In the new covenant, we've got another word that needs to come to witness. It's the word apostle. Apostle. And Dr. Stevens said something very interesting yesterday. He said, and he gave some, not all. The word some is concession. He gave concessions of himself, a concession. I think in mining terms, you can get a mining concession, which literally means the right, something conceded to you to mine certain things. So you can, you can get a concession to a piece of land where there's a, a vein of gold and you can mine it, or diamonds. That's your concession. But it doesn't mean that what you're mining is the only bit in the earth. That's just a portion of a vein but there are many other places that has gold mines or diamonds or minerals and so forth. Similarly, God has given us concessions of himself and these apostles, he's taken himself, as I put it, into, and, and put himself into 12 baskets. And those 12 baskets apply to the 5,000 company, the community of grace. And the word apostle means sent one sent one. And there's great pictures for that, and we've all got it. One who is like an ambassador, sent to represent his kingdom. Sent. One who heads a whole fleet of, 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 of ships that's going to colonize a new land. And you go with a mandate on behalf of your king, and you only represent your king in what you do. So when we're talking about witness, we are talking about an apostolic community, a global community of people who are on assignment to represent another, to represent the king. If you understood it, an apostle is not a, a person that functions uh, within this very contemporary culture of entitlement. He never seeks his own will. He only seeks to do the will of him who sent him. So when we look at witness here and we look at an apostolic community, the 44,000, we carry the name of our father. We do not want to in any way misrepresent his name, treat his name badly, distort his reputation, render him worthless. So whatever we do, wherever we are, even if we do not speak, we are on assignment sent by him to bring people back into his family. That's the gospel of salvation. Are you hearing me? Now that's witness. So my suggestion is, and I'll start closing because I don't want to go any further with this. My suggestion is that we should talk less and be more. My suggestion is that we should start practicing it in our immediate families. Let's not be the son of God to the world, but to your own spouse and your own kids, they don't see that example. My suggestion is that our neighbors should see the kind of people we are. I told you the best way to do this, and remember the ho ya principle. ho ya. I am that I am, as it's translated. God does not want us to become. God wants to be in us. God wants to exist in us. So come to the conclusion of emptying yourself every day and saying, God, you live in me the way you want to. It's not about my opinions. It's not about my ambitions, my desires, my agendas. You exist in me. Let me be a good example of you. And start practicing it. Practicing it. Start modeling it. And it, it starts to work. It's contagious. It's, infect it's infectious. Um, people will start, stop preaching. I mean, I, I, you know, I hang out with people um, and there are times I, I develop relationships with people They don't know much of what I do. They don't. Um, I have to do that now with the homeowners that I am 
you know, the, on, on the property that we're building. And when I first stepped into that environment, it was not pleasant, not pleasant. But I just was, I said to the Lord, I'll just be you there. And the more I function in that, the more concessions they give to me. And the other day, one of them who is a senior director of a company, he calls me and he says, how's the man of God doing? <laughs> and he was not mocking. He was so sincere. And I realized that you can create presence, force fields of environment. I realized that the greatest evangelist in this season, and not people that use it as an activity or event, but people who go out there and just become what God wants them and, and just allow God to be what he wants to become in them. You'll be surprised at how love and peace and joy comes into the hearts. You know, Marolan's got a friend who's so staunch as a Muslim, so staunch. And they became friends because of our kids. Our youngest boy was in preschool. She never once told them about Jesus. Not once. But this lady models, models here. Her kids were going to be sent to be priests in a Muslim school. Well, now they are studying to be doctors. That's how staunch they were. But when she wants advice, she will call Marola. She will ask for our kids. At that time, our kids were pretty well behaved. Don't know anymore. <laughs> she would ask for our kids to become a standard to help her kids become more godlike. And I know that something has been imparted 